welcome to our latest episode of Autism Confidential, the podcast from the National Council on Severe Autism. My name is Jill Escher. I am the president of NCSA. Uh, we are heading towards about episode 10. Woohoo! And um, today we're going to talk to um, a very well known advocate and writer, and now somebody who's featured in a documentary film. Um, someone who talks about issues of parenting and caregiving for our loved ones with severe autism and related developmental disabilities. Jess Ronnie, welcome to our podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Some of you might know Jess from uh, Jess Plus the Mess, which, oh, let's just start here, which was on Facebook and then was disappeared on Facebook. <laughs> Mm -hmm. right before like, the documentary came out right before the documentary yep. came out let's start with a little tangent Jess what happened uh no idea um I've worked you very a lot hard of followers I mean you were very active page yeah I did I've worked hard to grow my page and um literally about three weeks ago just received a notification that I was no longer an administrator and I had been replaced and I was like, is this a joke? <laughs> I had all the, you know, checks and balances in place, um, but I was hacked and my page is still there. All my content is still there. They are just using it to post really strange videos um, that my husband actually finds very interesting and told me that he watches them all. So I said, well, maybe I should hire these hackers once I get my page back to run my page. But yeah, that's, it's been very frustrating. Well, a very strange tale. Um, and we will talk about contact information where everyone can find you, you know, at the end of the podcast. So don't worry, people, even though she was hacked, you're going to be able to find Jess. But Jess is somebody kind of amazing. Um, I don't know how she does it. She juggles so many things. She has eight children, um, including Lucas, who has profound special needs. And she has been on the Today Show. She's been in the Daily Mail and the Huffington Post. Um, she runs a podcast called Coffee with Caregivers. She's written books, including her latest book, Blended with Grit and Grace. I, honestly, like I'm lucky if I can put on my shoes like in the day, and, like go to the market and the, the amount of stuff that you accomplish is, is truly amazing. So yay, well, Jess. Here today, we are actually gonna focus on one particular thing which is this month, and we're recording in the month of May, 2022, um, we have the uh, online premiere of a new documentary film called Unseen. And Jess is the principal character, really, in this documentary, she and her husband. Jess, let's talk about this. How did this film come about? Well, first of all, um, the online premiere starts today, May 20th. So, and it runs until the 27th. Um, so, yeah, this will air, uh, well, we can see. This, this might not air in time. Okay. Um, and then we will open it up to private screenings after that. But in 2017, I started the Lucas Project um, after my husband and I went through a very difficult stretch out in rural Tennessee and just became desperate for a break. Our son Lucas was going through puberty and the behaviors and aggression really increased during that period. And so I thought if we're so desperate for a break, other families must also be desperate for a break. We launched the Lucas Project, which serves special needs families with recognition and respite. The respite portion was easy in my mind. You know, it was finding a local school and just giving families a break. The recognition part was a little bit trickier in trying to determine how are we going to basically let society into our lives in a dignified way and in a respectful way, which is such a fine line, as you know, with severe autism, um, sort of displaying the hardships, but maintaining the dignity of everybody involved. We were approached, my family was approached by two um, companies interested in doing a reality show of our family living out in the middle of nowhere. And we were like, eh, it just didn't quite sit well with me. Um, you know, the moms aren't usually per portrayed very well in those. <laughs> I was like, I'm a not reality willing to, show. Yeah. I'll let everybody into my life with all these opinions and everything, but it did get my wheels turning. And I thought, well, maybe a documentary if the Lucas project could use its awareness 
mission to create this documentary and sort of peel back the curtain a little bit and let people into our lives because I think that's one of the biggest issues as a special needs family is we're so isolated and the world just isn't usually made for our children or our families. So the world doesn't really know about us. Um, I threw out this idea on Facebook and just said, I have this grand idea. I'd like to create this documentary and a local filmmaker and um, his wife reached out from Nashville and said, hey, it's so strange. My husband and I have been thinking that we'd like to do something similar. Would you be interested in meeting for lunch? And that was in 2018. And four years later, we made a documentary. Yeah, and it's a, it's a beautiful documentary. I did have the good fortune to see it. It's, it's very powerful and it, it's unsparing. It, it is not something that pussyfoots around mm -hmm. the incredible hardship, the incredible suffering, um, you know, the problems, you know, just getting along day to day, how the physical toil of it, the difficulty accessing any help, right? For, for so many families, not just you, it's not just mm -hmm. about you. You also feature a variety of other parents sharing their stories as well. And there's a consistent theme, <laughs> an unmistakable <laughs> consistent theme there. Right, we're desperate. Um, and even in you saying that, you know, people have said to me, how could you be so vulnerable? And it's like, that was just, that was a glimpse. I mean, we're still not showing you the nitty gritty. We're not showing you Lucas, like tearing his door off the, the wall. You know, we're not showing you the stuff that is extremely hard. Um, I think they did a really good job of sending the message or portraying the message through the caregivers and not so much the children, which mm -hmm. it is, it's about the caregivers and we need more resources and support and we need mm -hmm. options for these kids as they age. Right, and I didn't find that it was at all, you know, belittling of Lucas or any other child with a severe disability. It didn't question their value or your love for them, but it was realistic about how hard it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I think that sometimes caregivers are targeted by activists, right, as being uncaring and unloving um, or martyr moms or whiners, you know, when we talk about, you know, the incredible expense, the emotional hardship, the physical hardship. Um, and um, in reality, it, it's, it's not that. It's you have a situation that is incredibly hard that people who don't live it cannot imagine. I think it's unimaginable for the vast majority of people to, to know what it was like to, to live with my severe son. And I think it's the same with you. And you gave them that glimpse, you're right, without, you know, perhaps the hardest parts being shown. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So let, let me ask you um, this how did the filming go? How, how did you, how did the, how was the film made? Tell me about the making of it. Well, they followed our family around for about three years. Um, in the process, we moved twice. Um, that's kind of part of our story is chasing this unicorn idea of resources and support. You know, well, if we move towards Nashville, then maybe there will be more for our family. And we moved there and lived there for two years and there wasn't anything else. Um, and so just this past year, we moved back to my hometown in Michigan uh, because we have friends and family here. And we just kind of decided we're done putting our faith in the government. Um, and we need to be surrounded by people who really care about us and love us and will step into those spaces and help our family. Because like you mentioned, Lucas is one of eight kids. Um, so even if you aren't comfortable helping with Lucas, if you can help with his siblings, that's extremely helpful because as you know, when you have a child with profound autism, it's usually one of the caregivers is at home with that child um, for different, you know, variety of reasons, but then that's not fair to your other kids who never get to do anything or go anywhere. So that's been a really positive move for us. And Michigan is one of the, or it is the only state that allows kids to attend school until they're 26 years old. Um, and so that's been a huge perk, just knowing, okay, well, we've got, you know, 10 more years where he does have something to do. He has somewhere to go. He, he's got purpose. Um, and, you know, hopefully within the next couple of years, we can, we can add more to what we have going on here. At least that's my goal. Yeah. I mean, you're, 
Yeah, I know that's so weird about Michigan, <laughs> right? That 26 right. thing. Up. Like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, I know my son aged out. He's 23 now, but he aged out you know, at the end of age 21. And there was not a single adult program that would take mm -hmm. him. We which have is a similar scenario very here common right yes I very mean, common among adults with, with severe autism and related disorders the the programs say sure we serve people with developmental disabilities so long as they don't have behaviors right not <laughs> like, the really hard hey. ones yeah. or the ones in not diapers ones. right yeah. the, the briefs seem to be like another defining factor oh he's he's not toilet trained yeah we don't we don't do that so like the most severe, the people who need help more than anybody, like don't get anything. What do you think that your film Unseen, what, what are the major themes that you want people to walk away with? I think first recognize that these families are everywhere. I think everybody kind of knows that family with, and I'm doing this, you know, in air quotes with that strange child or scary child. Um, and just recognize that their life, their to-do list is so much longer than, than the typical family and step into, into their space in some way, shape or form, even if it's just a meal or saying, Hey, can I, you know, weed your flower beds or, you know, can I bring your kid home from soccer practice or whatever? Just really understand that with all the therapies our kids are involved in and all the appointments and all the extra and this and this and this we, we are an exhausted group of people. So just, you know, really begin to see those families in your own neighborhood. And then at a societal level, um, I mean, that we need so much change, you know, that as well as I do. Um, we particularly, I think, need options as these kids age, because that's not a life for anybody. It's not a life for the caregiver or the child to have your child, you know, sitting in your basement watching Veggie Tales for the rest of their life or whatever that looks like. Um, so we need more day programs. We need yeah. good quality residential assisted living spaces for families that want to go that route. And then removing the stigma too, that's attached to, I think, caregivers saying at 21, 22 years old, I don't know that I want to do this anymore. You know, I've said that at some point, I just want to be Lucas's mom and not his caregiver. I want somebody else to take over the caregiving role. And I just want to go sit with my son and have lunch or go to a movie with him, you know, fun mom stuff. And that's okay to say that, but I think it's removing that stigma and saying, I don't necessarily want to be his caregiver for the rest of my life. Um, because in saying yes to Lucas, it's saying no to a lot of other things, including my other children, my husband, myself. Um, and I'm not willing to do that. You know, I I think that's perfectly reasonable. You know, the people who kind of lob accusations at autism parents for, um, you know, complaining about their situation are people who haven't for usually like one day, you know, they haven't done the things that you have done a million times, mm -hmm. right? And um, if, if they were to walk a mile in your shoes, they would say, I can't wait to walk away from this. Right. I mean, as quickly as possible, as quickly as possible. And, and again, it's not that we don't love them. It's that it, it can be excruciatingly hard and humans have limits. You know, none of us were created as superhuman. We were just kind of normal people going about our lives, having children, you know, we didn't get like a special serum, you know, shot into our arm. <laughs> Right. They you made us extra that. strong and resilient. <laughs> right. you know, we, have, we have normal capacities, normal tolerance, um, normal finances. You know, we, we don't have, you know, uh, I just, I, I couldn't, when, when our son started attacking me and our daughter, it was literally impossible for me to continue as his caregiver in our house. Literally impossible because I spent every second of the day protecting my daughter. Mm -hmm. Right. So I have no problem saying, you know what? I can't mm -hmm. do this forever. It's just impossible. And I see that in family after family after family, it's not family saying like, Hey, you know, I just want to go to the spa for the rest of my life. Right. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. And, um, you know, but it takes hands. You know, we know these people take a lot of, a lot of, a lot of work. 
Um, mm -hmm. What did you learn from the other parents you know, that, that you interviewed and how did you choose them? Um, we, we asked for submissions for videos and then, you know, combed through those and picked out, you know, some of the, the better ones that we thought would fit the overall picture, um, and fit the storyline that we were trying to create. Um, and what did I learn? I think I learned that universally we are all dealing with the same issues, the same heartaches, the same worries and concerns over and over and over again we heard respite we need respite we need a break we need more funding um and then as these kids got older we heard over and over again we need more long-term solutions we need day programs we need assisted living options why aren't there any options available and just this exasperation and then an overall theme too of thank you so much for seeing us I thought we were the only ones going through this and you brought our story to light. Thank you. Um, we thought nobody cared. We, you know, over and over, no, our family has no idea what we go through. I can't wait to show this documentary to them. Um, so just, I would say this overall feeling of I've, I'm finally being seen. Nobody's ever related to my story before. So thank you. Um, and just, you know, a few, a few people have said, well, I have it way worse. Um, we've gotten some of that feedback and we like to remind people, well, again, you got the tip of the iceberg. We didn't show you, <laughs> we didn't go there, you know, out of respect for our family and Lucas's dignity. Um, but we've dealt with our fair share of very, very hard as well. And I think most families have. Oh yeah. Well, I'll give you an example. Last week, I, I bought Johnny, my son, a new leather sofa because uh, off of Facebook, I never get anything really new. Mm -hmm. uh, it lasted two days before he shredded the entire sturdy leather sofa till there was nothing left that remained looking like a sofa. I mean, two uh, days. <laughs> yeah, two days, two days. Um, and you wonder why my... Um, uh, we have to have a very specialized environment for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talk a lot about inclusion, but you know, uh, Johnny wouldn't last long in your standard group home or mm -hmm. a, you know regular, you know, apartment. He wouldn't last a day. So, um, okay, so I want to talk about this. You know, your 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 film is not about policy. Your film is about people and their experiences, mm -hmm. their stories, their concerns. Um, you don't take the next step and say, well, now let me talk like a bureaucrat and let's talk about what needs to change in our Medicaid system, you know? Well, we have so, versions that are gonna do that. Oh, what do you mean? So we've created a few different versions of the film for different audiences. Oh. Um, so we do have a version that's going to address more of the bureaucratic side of things. We have a version that's gonna address more of the church side of things. Um, the caregiver and the workforce side of things. So we're going to kind of tailor fit it to whatever audience needs to see it. Um, Interesting. So there's unseen yeah. version one, unseen version two. Just, unseen yeah, <laughs> just different talking points um, for the different organizations that might be impacted and might want to help change the system a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you this, speaking of people in the audience, um, there's a crowded world out there of media, you know, internet, YouTube, films. Uh, how, how can people, how do you expect people to find the film? How are you gonna reach the audiences you want to reach? Because I suspect that it'll be fairly easy to reach kind of the in crowd, you know, right. the, the families right. like ours who are affected. But for your average Joe on the street, Will this film reach them? Do you have a, do you have a sense of, of where it's going to go from here? That would be a question for the producer. Um, she has the whole marketing plan in place. Um, and I know, you know, we have the online global premiere from May 20th to 27th, and then we are going to open it up to different organizations. But you're right. I think those organizations will, also, will already be deeply invested in the lives of caregivers or in serving the special needs family in some way, shape or form. Um, ideally, I think churches need to get a hold of this because if the church is going to operate in the way that it says it should operate, you need to recognize these families within your communities and start to 
not like pressure them to come to church necessarily, but go be church to them, go to their homes, help them out. Um, and then other organizations as well, nonprofits and just corporations in general, we'd like to see this reach um, corporations so that they can understand how to be more accommodating, more inclusive, more flexible towards caregivers who do want to work, but it's so difficult to work when you have a child with profound disabilities. Yes, uh, I definitely had to quit my nine to five job mm -hmm. way back when. Um, and that's very, very common and research is validated. It's usually the mother who yeah. um, has to sacrifice her, her career. Um, yeah, and I, I, it's interesting because the, the film itself really focused on these local community type issues, like, you know, more awareness, more acceptance within the community, people lending a helping hand. But, you mm -hmm. know, somebody like me looks at it and says, that's all very nice, <laughs> but that's not going to get you very far. What's going to get you very far is going to be changes in federal and state policies right, mm -hmm. that facilitate lifelong care right. for the profoundly disabled. And it's those changes that we need. And it's, I, it's not impossible to change them, but it's, it's ex excruciatingly difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that we at NCSA care very deeply about reforming our broken system. Remember, we, it's not like we don't have, a, we do have a Medicaid system. You know, you know, we do have some subsidized housing systems. We, we do have other, you know, we have a social security, supplemental security income. We do have some safety net in place, but the safety net that is in place today is, was really designed for a much smaller population of disabled children and adults. Mm -hmm. And also a population that wasn't as severely disabled, right, right. as the people we, we see now. And well, so and let's, yeah, let's address that. And, you know, people will say, why do we have so many more children? And it's like, well, a hundred years ago, Luke and I would have died in childbirth. We don't see that anymore. We have the ability to save these children and save the mothers. And so we do have this population that is growing up with profound disabilities and they're going to need care most likely. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's why these rates are rising so astronomically as well. Um, it, one of the reasons I think there's many. Yeah, one of the reasons. Yeah, <laughs> many, many right, reasons right. that we we have yet to fully understand um, why these rates are rising. But policy has not kept up. There's a, no. there's a complete disassociation between what's really happening on the ground and where our systems of care are, mm -hmm. and they're still kind of locked in the 1980s, if you ask me. Okay, so what has the reaction been so far to the film? Uh, great. Um, almost five stars across the board. I'm sure. I'm sure the hate is coming. The, the controversy is coming. Um, you know, anytime you sort of put your life out there and are vulnerable and honest about hardships or whatever, you're going to have some, some people who don't agree and that's okay. Um, you know, you don't change things if everybody's agreeing with what you have to say. And it's probably not all that interesting if every, everybody's agreeing with what you have to say. So, um, but yeah, the feedback's been phenomenal so far. Well, that's good. And now let's talk about how people can find you, find the film. You talked about special screenings. I'm not sure if this podcast is going to be up before you said the 27th. Mm -hmm. mm, maybe we could do a special. <laughs> maybe mm. we do a special edition and just sort of <laughs> zoom it into the right. cloud, get it there up there. Um, right. Okay, so if people want to see it that you you have a website for unseen what's the mm -hmm. website caregiverdoc.com caregiverdoc.com and that will have com. a link to the premiere yes and then if people wanted to arrange a special showing you know for their group whatever it may be mm -hmm. um there's a link on there where people can contact yes everything's on there yep everything's on. okay caregiverdoc.com people and um, I hope that NCSA can also do a special show. And we haven't really talked about that, but um, hopefully we can think about something we can do through NCSA online as well. Yeah, that would be great. I know in Michigan, we had some, um, the director of Michigan Community Health came to our premiere 
and was deeply moved. And we've been in conversations with community mental health now about how we can improve, how we can get more day programs, more long-term assisted living options. So I think it does have the capacity to really spark those conversations um, with the people Mm -hmm. who need to hear them. That is excellent. Excellent news. And you know, at NCSA, we're very, very much um, in favor of any form of media that can raise awareness about the realities of severe autism and related disorders. Um, and uh, we are actually starting something called the NCSA Media Fund. And that is a fund that we hope to build over time where we can donate you know, and contribute to content makers such as yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, who want to tell these stories, but maybe just don't have the means to do so. So um, we we really think it's very important. What we see is a real bias in the media where it's very easy to tell happy stories Mm -hmm. about, um, you know, mental disabilities, uh, you know, the the kid who gives the graduation speech. We just saw a lot of that, right, Mm -hmm. last week. Um, You know, the kid who gets a nice job and now works at Microsoft. you know, the kid who gets married or like love on the spectrum or something like that. But it's very, it's so much harder to tell the stories about our kids. Mm -hmm. I don't think the world is ready for the true story of our kids. I mean, that would be pretty shocking. It is, but the stories have to be told and you're, Mm -hmm. you know, you took a big step in that direction. I mean, um, somebody on our board um, also created a, a much shorter video, a seven minute documentary yours is what 32 minutes or something like that yeah it's about 40 minutes now 40 minutes yeah we yeah um yeah and so you know we saw her create this video called um, a voice for severe autism we've seen different efforts and i i think we just need a lot more of it to raise what we call authentic awareness Mm -hmm. there's a lot of you know very cherry-picked awareness yes feel good exactly because then people don't have to do anything about it you put a story like ours out into the world and people don't really know what to do with that because once you see the reality you're either going to walk away or you got to step into the mess and do something about it and most people just are not ready for that lucas's story is interesting um he was born to your first husband he was He's the son of your first husband, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, your your uh, late husband um, died of a brain tumor. Brain tumor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In 2010. And then you got remarried. Um, and so the the father featured in this film is his adoptive father. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was interesting because it featured him a lot. <laughs> you know, he yeah. he was also he went way out there. You know talking about you know what he went through as mm-hmm. well as a father and um you know i think your, your story is just so interesting your whole family story is 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 amazing and i i just i, w- I won't give it away because i want people to watch the film i'm not going to give you the plot details or um, buy the books <laughs> yeah right. buy the books <laughs> right. watch the film right listen to her podcast <laughs> all the stuff right all the stuff good get on her hacked facebook page Right. I have a new <laughs> Facebook page. We can address that in a minute. Okay. Well, let, let's go there. Let's not talk about okay. where people can, can find you, Jess. Well, I'm at jessplussemess.com. That's where I blog. Um, and then the lucasproject.org is the nonprofit. And then on Instagram, I hang out at Jess Plus Semest, And I just started a new Facebook page at Jess Ronnie. And R-O-N-N-E. Mm-hmm. And I figure if the other one gets resolved, then I'll just merge them together. Call okay. It, oh, call I get it. Good. it. Okay. Yeah. Facebook page. Um, okay. Well, this is great. And my, my board has told me my um, podcasts go for too long. <laughs> so we're, we're now, I, mean, I now have a little leash around my neck. I'm like, okay, I guess I have to stop. Um, certainly we can go on, but we're going to have you back on the podcast for sure. And I think what I'll try to do is expedite this. So people hearing this can go to your website and can join the online premier. I think tickets are ten dollars. Yep. Yeah. And you can and, you uh, get a link and you can watch it like up to five times. Yeah. And the Lucas Project, it's a nonprofit, right? That mm-hmm. provides these, you know, awareness and support services 
Um, and what you're doing is really amazing on top of everything else. So thank you so much, Jess. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap up? I don't think so. Thanks for having okay. me. All right. Thank you, Jess. Yep. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Confidential. If you'd like to learn more, share an idea for an episode, or become a sponsor, please visit us at autismconfidential.org. The views expressed in this podcast are solely those of the individual speakers. Content presented is for informational purposes only, and we do not provide any medical or legal advice.